Good evening. Happy Fiesta. I see some of us are dressed uh, for the Fiesta occasion. This is a week of celebration. And uh, we're celebrating here at the Central Library with, with a very special guest who will be introduced uh, very soon. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Ramiro Salazar, director of the San Antonio Public Library. I want to extend to all of you a very warm welcome. Um, as I indicated earlier, we have a wonderful program and uh, we're excited to be presenting um, a very special guest and presenter. Uh, before I continue, let, let me see if I any board members that are here that I need to recognize. I don't see anyone, okay. Um, I do want to thank uh, Nowcast and the leadership of Nowcast for um, live streaming this particular presentation. Uh, Charlotte Ann, th thank you so much for your support and all you do to uh, empower the community with uh, not only information but the experiences that you share through your service. Thank you so much for what you do. Uh, April is uh, not only Fiesta, part of Fiesta, but it is uh, National Poetry Month and throughout the library system we're offering a number of programs to celebrate uh, the power of poetry. Uh, we're happy this evening to be partnering with the Department for Culture and Creative Development and I'm very pleased and honored to be introducing my colleague and the head and director of the Department for Cultural and Creative Development and that's Felix Padron. He'll be, come to the, be coming to the podium very soon. Uh, Felix, as director of uh, this very special department, you have uh, taken a department to higher levels of excellence and have uh, expanded your influence in the arts, which is very important in the city. And so I'm grateful for the work that you have done to enlighten the community with experiences in, in various forms of arts. And it is my pleasure at this time to invite uh, Felix to the podium and he will be introducing our special presenter today. Felix. Thank you, Ramiro, for that wonderful introduction, and uh, buenas noches para todos, y bienvenido a la Biblioteca Central de San Antonio. Es un placer. I want to thank you, obviously, everyone, for coming out tonight for this special occasion, and, um, and the library, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for partnering with us uh, for the special uh, presentation tonight. It gives me great pleasure uh, to introduce the wonderful guest that we have here, a very special individual. But first, uh, I want to give you a little bit of background on perhaps how we got here. Many of you may know that in 2012, in the year 2012, uh, San Antonio became the first major city, major city in Texas to appoint a poet laureate. And since then, uh, other cities have followed, including the city of Houston. They sort of got the bug and understood the power of having a Port Laureate and how transformational that could be. And then a smaller city, but equally important as the city of McAllen, which are do they're actually doing some pretty phenomenal stuff uh, in the Valley. Uh, they have appointed their own Port Laureate. So that's really uh, amazing that we have been able to sort of set that stage. We then, in 2012, obviously, we did appoint uh, Doctora Carmen Tafoya uh, as the first uh, Port Laureate for San Antonio. It was uh, wonderful to see how she was able to really take on the helm of that appointment for her two-year period and really did a remarkable job in transforming really the thinking about what we do, what we breathe, what we read in this community especially with the young people. She was able to do over 100 sort of presentations engaged in this community and that conversation. In San Antonio, obviously, we do recognize that poetry plays a significant role uh, in the culture of our day-to-day -day lives and education and how we shape our population to really inform and uh, uh, really support the sort of the brand that has been uh, anointed to the city, which is a city on the rise. And I think this is very much a part of that movement. 
Having a poet laureate brings to the forefront the necessity to promote literacy, poetic arts, and literature, and I think it goes even more beyond that. Our poet Laura will foster this message throughout her two-year term, which I will introduce her in a minute. Just a few weeks ago, our department had the pleasure of kicking off National Poetry Month with the appointment of our uh, well-deserved and treasured second poet laureate, Lorianne Guerrero. Gracias, Lorianne. Um, Lori, uh, many of you may know, was raised in the south side of San Antonio, yes. She attended McCollum High School and at the age of the tender age of 16, she had her first publication, pretty remarkable. While attending Palo Alto College, her composition uh, professor Linda Harris recognized Lori Ann's talent and encouraged her to apply to Smith College. She was accepted as a non-traditional uh, student. I think that's pretty special, non-traditional student. Love that term. And by then, uh, she was already actually a wife and a mother of three children. Needless to say, she preserved and sacrificed to pursue her dreams of writing and calling she, re calling she recognized uh, at a very, very young age. She went to graduate from Smith College with a degree in English Language and Literature and then received her uh, MFA in Poetry from Drew University. In 2012, uh, she won the Andres Montoya Poetry Prize for her first length collection, A Tongue in the Mouth of the Dying, which plenty of books, please buy them and she'll be reciting from that book in a little bit. The book was published by the University of Notre Dame Press in 2013. The author Martin Espada said this of Lorianne's writing, Guerrero writes in a language of el cuerpo, the body, viserio almost arbitrarily vivid, vivo, the language of a poet who knows how to work her hands, pretty remarkable, deep down, digging deep down in the soul. Lorianne believes that reading and writing lead to the awareness of oneself. And when we are aware that our voices have the ability to affect even the smallest change, we can become willing to strengthen them and share them. It is this reality that empowers our communities to seek higher education and to uncover untold stories. That's the basis of her poetry at this time. Since turning to San Antonio in 2008, or returning to San Antonio at, in that year, 2008, Lorianne has taught at Gemini Inc., Palo Alto, and the University of Incarnate Word. She has also been a visiting writer at UT El Paso and Our Lady of the Lake University. She has taken this year to finish her book tour and work on her next collection, A Crown of Gumen Sindo, which will be published, I think, pretty soon, ready to get published, so it will be pretty amazing. Looking forward to them. I will close with a quote from El Alcalde, Julian Castro, Following in the footsteps of Carmen Tafoya will not be easy, but Lorianne uh, Lori Guerrero is an inspiring choice who will amplify the importance of literary arts in San Antonio. Her personal story and professional success will resonate with muchos San Antonians. We look forward to the next two years as Lorianne carry carries on uh, this literary tradition in San Antonio that began last uh, two years ago. We want you all to stay involved with the great ideas and events to come. It takes a community to make this work and thank you all for being here and supporting not only Poetry Month but some, uh, supporting Lorianne Guerrero. Con eso quiero introducir a uh, the next, the poet laureate, Lorianne Guerrero. Bienvenido.
Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm really happy to, this thing is in my face. Can y'all hear me like this? Is this okay? There. I'm really happy to be here. Um, it's my first uh, reading as Poet Laureate of my city. Um, it's an honor. It's an honor and uh, it's unbelievable. I just did an interview with Texas um, Poetry Review, Borderlands, that's supposed to come out in June. And uh, my interviewer asked me, what does it feel like? What does this feel like? And you know, no one had actually asked me that, so it wasn't until I had this question and I had to write an answer that I really thought about it. And, you know, to be someone who, you know, the only girl in my family, the youngest, uh, I was constantly seeking a space from which to speak. Um, I wanted to be listened to. So to be in this space now, um, it's kind of that careful what you wish for. Right? Um, but I've, I've spent a lot of time, this is what I was telling the interviewer, I, I, I spend a lot of time looking in the mirror and reminding myself that this is what a poet looks like. This is what a strong woman looks like. This is how we do what we do. We just work hard and we be ourselves and, and we keep on fighting, keep on fighting. Um, so again, I'm really, really honored to be here. Um, I want to thank the San Antonio Public Library, which has been a lifesaver for me my entire life. Um, uh, the Department of Cultural and Creative Development um, for the support. Um, and Joel, I don't know if he's here. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to say too that, you know, poetry is such an important thing and, and it's important when we, you know, as, a, as an educator and as a mother especially, I try to get my students and my children to understand that when we're reading poetry, it allows us to access, access parts of ourselves that we wouldn't normally, uh, things we wouldn't normally think of or maybe things we're afraid to say. Um, and so in doing that, there's, there's an empowerment that happens that allows us to sort of walk through the world with confidence um, and, and makes us able to speak up for ourselves and for others um, and make change. And when you're writing poetry, it allows for this exploration of the self. Um, and it's in, it's in those moments when we're writing poetry that we're really able to acknowledge the things that we already know. Um, and I think certainly in communities like the one I grew up, I grew up in the South Side, in an underserved community, um, I think we were constantly striving to, to be better, do more, get out of that community. And the reality is, it's only because we had never really acknowledged what we already have. The smartest man I know was my grandfather. He had a third grade education. Um, and so to acknowledge that, I think it's really important that we do that for ourselves and for our ancestors and for our children. But I'm going to read to you from my book. It's for sale. Please buy some. <laughs> I keep it real. I'm a poet, right? <laughs> I'm going to start with the first poem of the book. It's called Preparing the Tongue. In my hands, it's cold and knowing as bone, shrouded in plastic, I unwind its gauze mummy-like, rub my wrist blue against the cactus of its buds. Were it still cradled inside the clammy cow mouth, I should want to enchant it, let it taste the oil in my skin, lick the lash of my eye. What I do instead is lacerate the frozen muscle, tear the brick-thick cud conductor in half to fit a ceramic red pot. Its cry reaches me from some heap of butchered heads as I hack away like an axe murderer. I choke down the stink of its heated moo, make carnage of my own mouth, add garlic. Um, this next poem, um, this next poem is called Sundays After Breakfast, A Lesson in Speech. There were no names for men like that. Gringos who stitched up their rules, their white garb, lace snugged the issues of the day, 
Lord didn't make us to mix with them folk, they said. But God's got nothing to do with the black boys jump still alive into a restless river. God's got nothing to do with having to tell their mamas. That bloody water ran through each dark vein across Texas, fed the Gulf, all its brown-skinned people. This, Grandpa could name, Los Cuerpos, bodies swaying above the cotton like sheets on a line. No importaba que no eres negro, pero que no eres gringo. No, it didn't matter that you weren't black, Grandpa says, pushing himself from the table, but that you weren't white. He lived his life this way, silent like every man after him, opening his mouth only to eat, holding his head above the cotton between white men and black boys. <laughs> Sorry. This one's called Roosters, Homecoming. They're roosters, she corrects me. Chubby cocks hang above our head from the ruffle of curtain in the room where her children eat. In her kitchen, next door to the house where I used to live, she laughs in two-step, pups a couple of dos equis con lima. I've missed you, neighbor, I say, peering through her window into the kitchen I used to cook in, next door, looking for the painting I left behind, the curtains I sewed looking to see if I damaged the counters with an imprint of my ass, wondering if my DNA might show up if detectives ever needed samples. Is my hair wound tightly in that carpet? Skin flakes painted into that red door. Neighbor tells me the new woman next door has a baby that cries all night, and when the man struts home at four in the morning, he crows like a madman. Our beer is ceremony. We talk about Maria. Remember her, her baby Louis? Did you know she was pregnant when he killed her? That he killed the baby first, the boy first in front of her? Our children rush through the kitchen, paletas in hand to the backyard with the men who love us today. Passing the sal con limon, we pray for the woman next door, hoping blood is never, sh never shed in my old home like in Maria's two blocks down. Neighbor fluffs her curtains. Come back, she says. Come back, and when you do, I'll bring you caldo the way I did when you were expecting La Chiquita, before you move to the snow, where roosters are thin and don't know how to dance. So one of the things that I explore in my book, or, you know, when I was writing um, or revising a lot of this book, I was living in Massachusetts. I moved there when I was 27, and I graduated from Smith when I was 30. Um, in those three years, I was finishing up this book. I shouldn't say, I was working on this book. Um, and there were so many things happening in my city, and I started to feel um, like I needed to get home, because I don't, I'm superwoman and I can save everybody. Um, I'm going to read this one. It's called Esperanza Tells Her Friends the Story of La Llorona. She killed her babies in the river over there by the Bill Miller barbecue place. You know, by the Holy Mother Church. She was friends with my grandma. They played bingo together, I think. Oh, yeah? Why'd she kill them? Psh, they were brats. And they were probably never helped her clean the house. And they were probably really whiny and always wanted candy in line at the HEB. How'd she do it, Espy? She drowned them one at a time, and herself too, I think. That's probably why she cries. She probably didn't mean to kill herself too. That's not how the story goes. My mom said it happened in Mexico and not San Antonio. Shut up, Patty. What do you know? Your mom's not even Mexican like us. Anyway, I think she reincarnates herself. Or maybe God doesn't want her in heaven because she's crazy and she killed her own babies. But she keeps coming back. Whatever, Espy. Serious. She comes back in real life and keeps on killing her babies. But I don't think she cries anymore. She's so used to it now. She's gone to Houston, Hudson Oaks, to Plano, even back to San Antonio right here in the south side. 
You think you know everything. Tell us how come sometimes she kills herself and sometimes she don't. I don't know. Maybe she cloned herself and now there's lots of Yoronas. Maybe someone you know, Patty. Maybe your mother. <laughs> I love reading that one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this one's called Ode to el Cabrito. I think most people know what cabrito is, baby goat, we eat it at Don Pedro's, yeah? Okay. <laughs> Ode to el Cabrito. More than sheep and cow and butterfly, I love you. No envy between us like the rooster footed. In your belly, I live like warm milk, goat thick and cloud heavy, lick you from the inside until the slaughter when your mother cries like my mother. When fire sends its last breath to the stars, I tear away your muscle, bubbling fat, and warm tortillas over coal. In the onion and cilantro, you do not recoil like the burnt skin of the pig, but spread yourself, sunbather. The rest of you still on the spit, gap-mouthed, your fleshless head tossed back, you love being loved. In the sweet meat of you, little hooved, little horned, I taste my own skin. Mm, cabrita. Love cabrita. <laughs> this one's called Stray Cat. She was fat, round as the moon and just as gray. She didn't have time for hiding, for safety, for hissing away onlookers. Her legs jerked and out rolled the little slick and warmy bundles. Two. She circled them, inspected the mousy ears, licked the furless pink skin. They made no noise. Their tiny hearts rippled, though softly. She ate one, then she ate the other. So I thought I had marked here. Um, yeah, I'm going to read. This one, yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, so one of the things that I was dealing with when I was living far away was this, um, my mother sends, calls me, um, and sends, starts sending me clippings from the, from the Express News about the babies that were found under a house in the south side. And maybe because I was postpartum, I don't know, but it really, it took a toll on me. Um, and so I have these two poems that I'm gonna read to you from that experience. The first one is called Babies Under the House for Soraya and Sebastian. When you open your eyes again, Soraya, this will just be one of those things, like rice and bean tacos every night, having to go to the free clinic, buying gas with food stamps at Ben's Ice House at the corner of Pleasanton and Petaluma. But you know that, don't you? Know that your body will never grow completely. When you open your eyes, your skin will be smooth as the day you were born, not what it was when they found you and the tiny thing that was your brother. The dirt around you will have licked away mother's milk from your lips, absorbed the sour scent of mother's breath on your neck, the iron-heavy taste of blood in your mouth you won't even remember. When you open your eyes again, Soraya, you will be the mother. Your tart Mexican heart won't let you be anything else. No need for grown-ups, child protective services who were too busy, the legislators who couldn't give medication, education to this poor neighborhood, this city, La Raza with no muscle, no voice, hope decomposing in a couple of plastic bags. But there are two things you will have that your mother never did, a whole Soraya, a whole Sebastian. So when this was happening, um, these, this fear of violence that you know I grew up around, um, start, I, I guess when I became a mother, it really started infiltrating my, my psyche and, and my dreams. And there are many poems that I write that are straight from my dreams. Um, I kept dreaming that 
that I was going to die. And this one day, I woke up and I sort of rolled out of bed and wrote down the dream word for word. And I revised my poems, you know, 20, 15 times. This one got very, very little revision because it was, it was just, bleh, it was straight out. <laughs> it was just, um, this one's called Morning Praise of Nightmares. When the steak knife fiddled against the sinew of my gut, I heard the slow whine, felt each ridge, felt the simmering red erupt like the juice of an overripe plum, the tickle of nectar running down the body still warm from the sun. And from the kitchen to the street fair, as it often is in dreams, children laughing, a clown, the color yellow, balloons melting against the burned sugar of the skin, and guns, tiny, like from gumball machines in tiny hands. Bullets, red and green and gunmetal blue, piercing the skin like bot flies, their metal heads in deep until that offspring, that winged blood, gently and timidly took flight. Then the peeling of my skin. Who was that crafter whose face I never saw? The paper maker, his teacup hands, his clothespin fingers, rinsing least the rinsing clean the lace of my forearms, the squared off torso, long sheet of leg, thick bit of finger and toe like strips of bacon, strung up, decorating that red room like black and white photos developing mountains or smiles or sex. I could taste my own blood, though I couldn't lift my hands to finish the job, put myself out of misery. I was but remains, a piled heap of slop on the floor of a house I never shared a meal in. Even my eyelids were gone, and my spine exposed. I was an afterbirth without the birthing, a too early puppy whose whole pink body thumped with each beat of his slow heart. This is my morning praise of nightmares. Open your eyes. I hear three mouths whisper against the flower of my skull. Mama, open your eyes. Thank you. <clears throat> Sundays after breakfast, a lesson in cotton picking, South Texas, 1943. It was a kind of dance feet shuffling in dust, fluttering hands like birds nest building, blood staining brown birds red, cotton sacks 12 feet long dragging behind like a tongue fat and slow as sun. I watch him, slow weep of his eye remembering the girl who'd name and nurse nine children. He picks my grandma by the color of her dress, her eyes, and because she's lucky, not by how much cotton she can pick. So, how are we doing on time? Anybody? <laughs> okay. Um, I think I'm gonna read two more from here. This one's called Put Attention. Put attention, Grandma would say as if attention were a packet of salt to be sprinkled or a mound we could scoop out of a carton like ice cream. Put attention, put attention, put it where? In her hands, in the percolator, on top of the television set that seeps fat red lips and Mexican mustaches, next to the Jade Buddha, between La Virgen and Cousin, Vin Cousin Pablo's sixth grade class photo, Marth marshmallowy teeth jumping out of his mouth, we never corrected her. Like the breast, Spanish lulled grandma's tongue as we threw down shards of English, laughing for her to leap in and around. Put attention, put attention, put it where? Shall I put attention in my glass and drink it soft like Montepulciano de Abruzzo, like Scheinerbach, Orchata? Put attention, ponga atención, she tried to say in our language. Put attention somewhere large, back into her eyes, in the part of her brain that doesn't remember her own daughters, how to make rice, 
translate instructions. Thank you. Don't take the baby out of here. Y'all keep the baby in here. Do I need to? Okay. Can y'all? Oh, that's better, right? Oh, I gotta do overs. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Okay, that sounds really loud. Is this this is better? Okay, sorry. <clears throat> this next poem is called. Um, well, I gotta tell the story of this poem. It's called Wooden Box. Um, my grandfather, when I got back from Massachusetts, he uh, he asked me. He called me Piyuya. Piyuya, what do you want? And. Uh, I wanted him to take the the, recla the lumber that he'd been storing in his shed um, and make me a dining table with it. He couldn't understand why I wanted this, but that's what I wanted. And he said, okay, well, start pulling that lumber down and we're gonna make a table. So we started doing that and I got in his way. So he sent me out and I went to go get him a glass of water. When I got back into the workshop, he was kind of sitting, sitting on a bar stool and he was kind of slumped over I said, Grandpa, what's going on? You know, he looked sad, and he said, you know, I'm over here making you this table. I should just build myself a coffin. This one's called a wooden box. He demands this, nothing else. No mahogany slick or roses kissed by lilies, no music or speech, weeping limited. We are to file down the aisle, nod head to his dead body, return home to care for things still living. We are not to sob for the child him, the bed an alphabetless picker of cotton, potatoes, tomatoes, follower of crops. We are not to sob for the cactus man, vaquero, lover him, grandpa who takes his milk from the moon, who knows the time for cookie, the time for wine, no. When he is gone, he will be gone. I can make the box myself, he says. I can make it myself. I used to cry through that one. I don't anymore. <laughs> I'm getting better. Um, I'm gonna read this last poem from the book and then I'd like to share some new work if that's okay with everybody. Um, my grandfather was blind, and uh, this one's called Unblinding. When finally the shadows grow like cactus, scraping the iris gray as the sea, and I no longer see the articulation of a bird's wing or the curve of my own magnificent knee, when finally the nerve behind that bulbous white, that tickle of brown, forgets its job, loses its mind to time, erupting hot and slow as magma. Know that I know the magic of the blind. I have cataloged your hands in my hands. So thank you. I am, um, I am working on um, new poems um, about my grandfather. <laughs> um, I lost him in July. It's been almost, oh, it's been nine months yesterday. Um, so the book that I'm working on is called A Crown for Gumesindo, and it's a crown of sonnets, which is a series of 15 sonnets. Um, so the, the last line of the first sonnet begins the second sonnet, and the last line begins the third, and so on, and it, it forms a, a wreath or a crown. Um, I'm only gonna read three from the crown. It's not finished yet, but it's almost finished. Uh, I'm going to read you number seven, number eight, and number 11. Number seven, newborns. I can't see. That's better. Newborns. Let's look at our reflection in the mud. See how in four months each of us has changed. What is your name without a body? My name without you here. I am new. What I never was. Suddenly, I carry my newborn grief like a new mother, nursing and swaddling my most fragile, my newest, my sweet. What festers in the bellies of strangers does not concern me. There is only this. I am the only mother. Mine is the only child. 
I decompose alongside you, wanting and not wanting everyone to see, off balance and leaking my skin in strands, the oddity that was put in my hands. Number eight, Dia de los Muertos. The oddity that was put in my hands, your truck. It used to be I drove this road each week to pick you up. Now I drive this road each week to lay you down again. Today is the day of the dead. When did you die? Today I bring you chicharrón con huevo, chile, which is to say I bought breakfast to the goats. I want to slip my hand into the photo of you, fix your hair as I did, help you with your sweater, guide the salt to your plate. The grass is starting to grow over you. Shards of rock gone smooth, I sing to the bees. I lay my ear to stone, it doesn't hurt. I hear your voice rising from the dirt. And this will be the last one. It's called casketing. Um, it's number 11 um, of the 15. Casketing is another dream poem. Oh, I can't see. Casketing. I've buried everything I've ever loved in the bone of reason. Now, even in sleep, you are dead. Sometimes in your metal-colored coffin, I wheel you to the grocery store, once to a papery, twice to Fiesta Bakery on Pleasanton. You are heavy. Once I was in high school in a play and parked you stage left. Always I shake you, wake up, damn you. Sometimes the casket is open and I kick you. And when in my small shoes I make contact, your ribs crumble like the bark of an old mesquite. Wake up, wake up. We cannot run the numbers, argue, make your mother's bread if you are always going to be dead. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. I really appreciate it. I'm Carrie Moxfigemba, and on behalf of the San Antonio Public Library, I'd like to thank Lori for attending today and all of you for coming. Um, we also have a copy of her book, A Tongue in the Mouth of the Dying, that is going to permanently be a part of our Latino collection. Um, we are going to have her autograph it right here today so that it will go upstairs and uh, be here forever. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Lori. It's such an honor. I love it. Okay, so.